So welcome to today's uh, Lottery West Heritage Conversation, which is a part of our 2022 Western Australian Heritage Festival, which is supported by Lottery West. As the only state government owned lottery in Australia, where all the profits are returned to the community, Lottery West is committed to supporting Western Australian community groups, and we thank them for their support uh, that enables us to deliver programs such as this Heritage Conversation today. I've got lots of notes. So, uh, a very special welcome to Lisa Collier. Uh, Lisa, as you may know, uh, is a very productive practising poet in Western Australia, uh, her adopted side of Australia. Yes. But you're very welcome. Uh, and I think that's you know that's one of the one of the great things is when people look at uh, look at our world through the eyes of um, another place. Uh, I would also like to uh, welcome Nan and John Harper. So Nan and John Harper are not here in an official capacity, but through their great interest in Woodbridge, and Nan uh, and John through John are descendants of uh, the Harper family who built this house. Welcome John and welcome Nan. Um, and finally, uh, I'd like to thank all of our National Trust members who are here today. Uh, it makes us really, really pleased to be able to welcome you to these sorts of events uh, where we can enjoy you know, uh, an intimate and inclusive occasion uh, in a very special heritage place, talking today as we will about heritage through the lens uh, of poetry. Um, and you know, it really responds to our mission, which is about connecting communities to the value of Western Australian heritage. So I'm going to start by telling you a little about Woodbridge, uh, the place where we sit today and where we meet. Uh, as you are probably aware, there's a very long and layered history to this place. It goes back much further than this house, uh, and it was indeed a place which the Aboriginal people called Mandoon, a very special place on the banks of the uh, Durbel Yerrigan, uh, and we know that uh, not far from here there were important corroboree grounds. This was a very important place for uh, the Wajuk Noongar people. Uh, it's at the juncture of three major waterways that intersected the, uh, that indicated the boundaries rather between different Wajuk groups. People traditionally gathered here for ceremonies, trade uh, and cultural events. Uh, the rivers and all they offered meant this location was and remains to this day uh, spiritually and materially significant. When Captain James Stirling led a small uh, party up the Durbel Yerrigan in 1827, he was quick to recognise the desirability of this location uh, in an area that was at the upper reaches of the river as being fertile and in a lot of places partly clear due to, uh, due to cultural burning. On returning to the Swan River colony in 1829, he claimed uh, 1,620 acres at Mandoon for his private estate, which he named Woodbridge, as it reminded him of the uh, area around the home of his wife's family in Surrey in England. The land was purchased in 1883 by agricultural entrepreneur, parliamentarian and part owner of the West Australian newspaper Charles Harper and his wife Fanny. In 1895, Charles Harper established a school in the house in this room uh, for his ten children and those of his neighbours. Five years later, a small single-storey building was, con was constructed down uh, a little further from here uh, at where Guildford Grammar School now sits, and that was the commencement of the beginning of Guildford Grammar School. For 20 years, from uh, 1921, the house operated as Woodbridge House School. Uh, during World War II, it was used as an old women's home uh, before in uh, 1964, it became an annex to Governor Stirling High School. So it's a, it has many, many layers, this place. Uh, it was vested in the National Trust in 1968, uh, and we have been welcoming visitors here for the last 54 years. Uh, we've carried out significant conservation works to the fabric of the building, uh, and we continue to do so, uh, so that it can be a place of stories uh, for future generations. So Lisa, uh, Lisa was the recipient of an Inspire Writer in Residence residency uh, in, 19, in 2021. 
Inspire is funded by the Department of Local Government, Sports and Cultural Industries, uh, and we're very, very pleased to announce that there is yet another uh, residency coming up this year as the government, uh, as the government has funded another series of Inspire work, uh, writers in residency for us. So if there are any budding writers here today, uh, keep an eye out on our website for the Inspire residency program, which will be announced very shortly. So I'm going to give you a brief uh, introduction to Lisa, and then I'm going to ask Lisa to commence by reading some of her poetry. Uh, we'll then have a little discussion about her response to place uh, and the way in which you know, she's been, um, I guess, stimulated to uh, respond to this place during her residency. And then we're going to have a bit of a Q&A and we're going to welcome, uh, welcome ideas and uh, uh, the celebration of uh, Lisa's work from the floor. So Lisa, Lisa is a poet and educator living and working on Wajak Nungabuja. She writes poetry with a lens on women's bodies like the jagged edge of a can opened up, she says. We might have to ask you to explain that a little bit later, Lisa. Uh, Lisa is shortlisted for the Dorothy Hewitt Award for her unpublished manuscript, How to Order Eggs Sunny Side Up. Congratulations and good luck, Lisa. So I'm going to take a seat and enjoy uh, the first of your readings. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Julian, for that introduction and also acknowledgement to country. Um, and I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past, present and future. And I'd also like to thank the National Trust of WA for this um, fabulous opportunity for someone like me, an emerging poet. It's been huge uh, for me. So I'll just read a couple of poems. Yeah, yeah, to begin with, just to, for you to get a taste of my work, maybe understand the jagged edge of a can opened up. Needlework. It's hard to believe the butterfly fruit service is pristine. Her hair parts lit peel. The candlelight projects the crowning calyx. The double bed's iron legs, a pedestal of ballasting fruit. The cruel stitch of an intricate knot to mend scored pip. A slap to revive a delicate constitution. A pomegranate rupture on hairpin lace. Property rights. A fan covert is a roof overhead, slippers in the doll's house to role play, a contract to wedlock. Her bequest is Shetland lace, held by a napkin ring as protection loophole. Hush, hush, she needles open space with bob and yarn, a magic trick to slip through and prate her own name. Oh, Lisa, why don't we just make a start? Thank you. So I wonder if you might just share with us where the stimulus for those uh, two poems came from and, and sort of what you saw and what the process was that led you to that creative expression. Okay, sure. Well, the first one, Needlework, um, I first visited Woodbridge before I applied for the residency to find out what my inspiration was to, uh, you know, for my application. And I was really taken with the portrait of Phoebe Pereira upstairs in the nursery. And it says at the bottom there that she was at all uh, Fanny Harper's confinements, and which I didn't know what that meant at the time, but it means her giving birth to her pregnancies. And when I did research on her, I found that she was a general house servant and she also did lace work. And so I was immediately taken with that juxtaposition between this, all this white lace and doilies and things that you'll see in the property when you go for a walk, and then the blood and chaos of childbirth. And so the butterfly fruit service you'll see in the dining room, and it's this beautiful fruit, tiered fruit service in pink, with individual butterfly designs, which was a gift, a wedding gift to Fanny Harper when she got married. And that was my first thought was, wow, it's amazing that it's still in perfect condition. So that's sort of the opening stanza. Um, and the pom there's a pomegranate tree just out there because this was, of course, an orchard during the Harper's time. So it's sort of 
a combination of all of those sorts of things. Wonderful, thank yeah. you. So does anybody have any question of Lisa following that poem and the stimulus that she's uh, expressed there? Well, I would have liked to have heard the story first, then the poem, that we could fit it in because yeah. we said the poem, it's gone out the window, and I'm trying to bring it all back together. So, yeah. you know, for the story first, would have helped me. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. We could always do that. We could do that. Or why don't we do that? Why don't we just read that poem again, shall we? Right. <clears throat> Needlework. It's hard to believe the butterfly fruit service is pristine. Her hair parts split peel. The candlelight projects a crowning calyx. The double beds are legs, a pedestal of ballastined fruit. The cruel stitch of an intricate knot to men's scored pip. A slap to revive a delicate constitution. A pomegranate rupture on hairpin lace. Thank you, Lisa. So uh, the comment from the front was that the poem was beautifully visual. Thank you. And a, and a question up here? Oh, yeah, OK. It's, so I was looking at the anatomy of a pomegranate. Yeah, so a calyx. Um, from memory was the, the leaf sort of at the bottom, so it's sort of a botanical term. So same with ballastine. So that's something I do a lot with poetry, is say I'm talking about pomegranates, I'll look up the jargon around um, that and use different words, so I was sort of drawing on that. Interesting that you picked up on Fanny Harper. Yeah. One of the issues that we at the National Trust face in researching and telling the stories of the places that we care for is that quite often we know a lot about the males who were the people that built the homes, uh, you know, had wonderful careers, but of course we all know that they were supported by strong and wonderful women. Uh, I was very interested, uh, John Harper has recently completed a book on, uh, on Woodbridge and uh, and Charles, uh, and he's managed to find quite a lot of information on a lot of the women that were a part of this landscape over the decades. So was that a particular focus for you in coming here, knowing that this is such a, uh, a place about Charles Harper, for many good reasons, but to try to find some more of the texture of the females that supported him and indeed supported this house. Yeah, absolutely. And that kind of underpins most of my work. It tends to be about women's experiences. Um, so what I noticed about all the properties when I researched initially before applying was the gaps and omissions around women's experience by their maiden name, who they married and how many children they had. And that was pretty much all that you could find, reflecting the attitudes of the day. And so I try with my poetry to give voice to women's experiences, but also agency. So that's really important for me. And I might just, is it possible if I can explain like that second Please. poem that I read? Yeah. Yeah. Because that's an example of it. So yes, I, I'm interested in the marginalised and their experiences of oppression, but I'm not interested in victims. I'm not inter inter uh, interested in projecting victims. I'm interested in projecting agency. And so I set myself the challenge for every poem, how was I going to project agency? And I did it in lots of different ways. So with Property Rights, the second poem that I read, I looked up and at the time that Fanny and Charles were married, um, married women at the time legally could not own property. So the only contract they could have was marriage. And a woman known as a femme covert, married woman, um, in the legal terms, as soon as she was married, she had immunity from the law, which meant that whatever, if she committed a crime, for example, it was her husband's responsibility. <laughs> So it kind of worked both ways too, and there's some great examples that I read over Reese where, you know, this woman was running some 
Sly Grog Racketeer, and they, but she was separated and the husband got done for it, but anyway. Um, so I was sort of drawing on that and I, I was interested in lace work because, you know, all these doilies, we kind of look at them now as fussy old things, but really they're, they're heritage and they're female heritage. And so I kind of see them as a legacy, so I use that quite a lot. And the napkin ring, Shetland lace, was lace so fine you could thread it through a wedding ring and that really captured my imagination and, and the napkin rings on the, the dining room. Um, and the agency, so it's a bit magic realism, I guess. So the last line, she needles open space with bobbin yarn, you know, you think of the holes in lace, a magic trip to slip through and prate her own name. So, you know, Fanny de her, her own name, not her married name. And I use the word prate, which is a very old fashioned word because it comes from prattle. And you know how often women are associated with being prattlers and gossip. And so I'm kind of, um, I guess, taking that and making it an empowered thing. It sure does. Yeah. So let's have another poem, Lisa. Okay, let's do it. <clears throat> oh, shall I explain it first? <laughs> shall I do that? Yeah. All right. Um, so I was really, uh, one of the other things that I was very much drawn to, probably mostly, was the time that Woodbridge was a, a, an old aged home for women. So women were quickly transferred during World War II from the Frio Asylum, because I think it was used for barracks or something for American soldiers, I'm not right. 100%, um, but they came here and it was all rushed and they had to quickly adjust things and it soon became overcrowded. And at the time, what was happening last year, of course, with the COVID pandemic, was an aged care crisis. And it's been going on for quite some time, but it really came to the fore and of course there was the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety in 2019, which I read that entire document and looked at all the issues of aged care, which are pretty horrific. And there was a lot of uh, crossovers. I thought, well, not much has changed. So this poem, once again, I'm interested in agency. So I'm trying to have a speaker who's resisting, in this case, death because there's this idea that you come to aged care and you're there to, you know, that's your last place. And I drew on Greek myth. So Thanatosis was the Greek god of painless death and it also means like animals will play dead, um, which probably people know. And Keris were the sisters who waited in the underworld with gnashing teeth for people to die. So I've drawn on that. Um, and I've also drawn on when you walk around that house, um, some of the elderly women actually slept out on the balconies. At first they had uh, awnings to cover um, and then they built asbestos, asbestos shadows and had louvers. Um, but, you know, Matron Powell was constantly writing to the health department about a lot of problems, water coming in. Um, and it was so windy that there was actually documentation that one woman pinned her, her bed sheet to her nightie. Um, because it was blowing in the wind. Um, and there's also a pressed posy that was found in the roof when they restored it, and I love that pressed posy. I've used it in two poems, so hopefully that helps. Thanatosis. Cease, Keris. I'm asbestos in exile, plain possum. A cock queen of bedsore retardant. A pressed posy of floorboard damp. I desist your night jar gale, your wet flame of louvered breath to billow the jib. I pin the bed sheets to a dormitory hulk and sip cocktails from a muslin cap tea service to muzzle the sound of brocks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just for your reference, the photograph over here on your right is the photograph of Woodbridge when it was uh, this place for uh, elderly female patients who were transferred, as uh, Lisa says, very quickly uh, when the Americans took control of what is now the Fremantle Arts Centre uh, down, in, down in Frio. Thank you for that poem. That was wonderful.
So tell us a bit about the jagged, the jagged can. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I think because uh, my poems are quite visceral, um, I sort of like to maybe talk about things that aren't spoke about in polite society or day-to-day -day conversation. I guess for me, poetry is getting to the insides, the feelings, the visceral, um, the things that we don't talk about because it's not really polite or comfortable in everyday conversation. And so a lot of my poetry is very raw um, and might talk about um, those intense experiences that we have, but there's not a lot of room to talk about them yeah. just in conversation. So I guess that's where I'm coming from. Yeah. That's wonderful. Let's have another poem. Okay. Domestic ardour. Air pressure is my night, pounds per inch. The spectacle of life still silvery, twilight bunked on an antique sardine dish. I trail flocked wallpaper, the scale of cockatoo tail, to hold hands with doorknobs, the relief of risk. To press into gyp rock, encounter friction, my cornered hips incline to niche. I fall hard for carpet stubble, brush knees and palms, fingers lock in a shag pile loop. The westerly whispers sweet talk as I need flour and yeast and make believe. And I'm sorry, I forgot to explain. <laughs> Have we a response? To, have we a response to that poem from the floor? <laughs> oh, thank you. Is there? Uh, so you led that uh, applause. Do you have a comment on it? Did it reach you? Well, it just allows us in the room just to think whatever we can think about it, and the agency thing that you're arriving at is just there. It's just vivid. Thank you. Thank you. But that is an interesting issue, isn't it, with poetry? Because some people find just having the dots and joining them together themselves, you know, one of the delights of being able to join in a, a, a session such as this to share a poet's words. And other people perhaps uh, are, you know, maybe more literal and find they like to have the story sketched first. I think both work, uh, but I certainly, uh, I'm sure Lisa will appreciate your comments. So thank you very much. And that's why this word is to sort of to be told first a few little clues or hints about the poem coming out. Yeah. If you have the poem in front of you, then you know, then you know, you get to the end and think, ah, you know, I'd like to read to the end to see what, what I've missed or what else there is. So, we can, yeah, yeah. But of course, as a reader, we only hear it once. That's yeah. true. So, Lisa, how do you respond to reviewers of your poetry? Do you, do you find that a positive experience or do you find it confronting in your own right? Well, to be honest, I don't really have many reviews because I don't have a book out yet. Yeah. Um, although, the, the only thing that I've really read, I guess, which I do find really interesting is judges' comments. Mm. Um, that's fascinating. So, for example, the Dorothy Hewitt judges' comments. The comments are great, but I actually think they're better than my manuscripts. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, keep talking. So, I'm like, yeah, that's on the back of the book. No. It, but it is fascinating what they pick up on, because you never know, you know, you're coming at it in a certain way. And to be honest, when you write poetry, well, for me anyway, I don't want to speak for everybody, I don't usually know what's going to come out until it's written. Mm -hmm. I'll have inspiration and I'll do research, but then it kind of goes on its own. And then it's like, oh, that's interesting. That's what I think. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, but that's, everyone writes differently. Um, so, yeah, it is interesting to see what people have to say. I'm not at the point yet having a book to see negative reviews. I'm sure I'll <laughs> run away and hide and ruin my career. <laughs> not at all, not at all. So, um, w one of the things that is very evident from your readings today and looking at some of your other poetry is how 
you manage to explore what seems like almost a banal and bring it up to uh, represent our humanity. Yeah. Uh, I was interested in, and I'm, you may not have something from this collection, but I was interested that you were uh, inspired by wrapped sandwiches. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that was recently. <laughs> Would you uh, perhaps uh, elaborate on the point I've made and how, you know, what seems to be mundane can actually be the stuff of uh, wonderful poetry? Yeah, for me it is the everyday is extraordinary and I definitely want to um, give voice to that. You know, what is considered, I guess, the domestic zone being typically classified as the female zone. Um, you know, there's, there's whole worlds going on. Um, it's not all about, you know, big wars and powerful politicians and uh, celebrities and the big gestures in life. And I think some of the small gestures can be equally revolutionising, oh, that's the wrong word, uh, revolutionary, sorry, um, in, in terms of resistance. I think that we all resist um, when maybe things aren't going the right way or, or you feel oppressed or you might not feel oppressed, I don't know. But it, you know, I think there's empowerment in all aspects. So yeah, I don't know, I, I'm interested in everything, yeah. So, so would you, have you something else to share with us in that line of thinking where you came here and you saw sort of small things and they inspired you to uh, bigger themes? I guess so, yeah. Um, so I might explain this one. So this poem, The Time Piece, I'll, and when you walk around you'll see there's lots of clocks and they're all, they're stopped, um, and they all have a different time in every room. So I thought, oh, that just caught my imagination. And once again, I drew on that coral posy. Um, and I also drew on the fact that um, the Harpers lost their two sons in Gallipoli. And so I kind of linked the sort of small thing to that. The timepiece. A clock observes a heartbeat's arrest. In each room, semaphores signal a different time. Conservation cleaners stir up dust to maintain the complexion of a coral posy. Youth is a benefit of crap kept in an attic, bustling to canter from the bit of crinoline. The core of crow's feet held at arm's length. Her two sons wave a redundant alphabet, brought to you by the letters G, R, I, E and F. Mm -hmm. That's a remarkable piece of work. That was, um, so tell us about that. Did that come in one sitting or was that the result of, uh, of significant rewrites? It's interesting because some of the poems, like the one I wrote before, Domestic Ardour, that killed me. I wrote that about 50 times. <laughs> it was like, it was driving me nuts. This one was practically written in one go. It was amazing and it, and it varies. Like some are hard and some are easy. Um, but yeah, I just, it just depends. Um, but you know, saying that, I strongly believe that a lot of it's percolating for a long time. Um, and a lot of the work of poetry happens when you're not actually physically writing. And so I tend to sort of draft it and then go away and then come back and then you look at it again and go, oh, I hate it. And you know, blah, blah. it's a to and fro sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. So you are a poet on a constant basis. Yeah, I am because I, I left my teaching job to become a full-time poet. Mm. Yeah, because yeah. I wanted to follow the big bucks. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't regret it for a second, I love it. <laughs> so, it's interesting, how do you see poetry in the arc of creativity and I guess engagement with the community. It, I'm wondering whether or not we can find a bigger audience for poetry or do you think it already has a sizeable audience? I don't think it has a huge one but I believe it's growing. 
There definitely is evidence out there of, um, you know, poetry being uh, taken up, especially with spoken word. Um, you know, look at Amanda Gorman's speech at Biden's inauguration. I think that inspired people around the world more than anything else that happened that day. And so that's just an example. And I think too, you know, we live in such a precarious time that so I think poetry, because it gets to the heart of things, is becoming more and more um, sort of accessible and, and needed, I think, to give expression to the way we're feeling, which isn't always logical. Yeah, yeah. it's a wonderful answer, thank you. Let's have another poem. Okay. All right. Okay, so um, this is one about aged care. Um, and I was thinking about this idea of leaving your house and going into aged care. You know, you've got this whole house and, you know, you might take one bag. And also, Matron Powell was talking about there was no storage because the place was so overcrowded for the women that some of them had their bags just by the side of their bed. And in fact, the balconies were partitioned off and it was just room enough for a single bed and a little side table. And they were all separated by wood. And so I, and it got flooded. And so um, that sort of inspired me. Um, and as well, I guess, you know, stories of elder abuse uh, that you unfortunately hear. That's on the increase, especially maybe and I know it's only some people, obviously, um, after people's inheritance or whatever, so it was inspired by that. En route. A single suitcase. What will I pack? My home? A two-by-one brick and tile boutique villa you've since spent? Nobody wants to hear my flesh groan. I will not burden you with keepsakes destined for the charity box. I can't strip away wallpaper. The mural is dry paint. A memory stick is a placeable face. The music on shuffle, like contact you divvy between visiting hours. <coughs> Perhaps I'll leave the suitcase empty. And when I find myself a routine round, a pocket nosegays from the garden you dug and climb in. I think, I think by the time I think the original purpose of that muse of that uh, hospital was a place to put uh, people who were considered by society. Sorry, I've got a, an answer at the back. It is now. Um, for a long time, it was a lunatic asylum, as they were called then, and then it became what was called a home for distressed mothers, which basically means single mothers, and it was that for about 20 years up until the Second World War, and the barracks that you referred to and was referred to earlier, they, all the women were moved out to here because the buildings were taken over by the US Navy to command, as, as a command center for the Indian Ocean submarine fleet. There were 150 US submarines based in Fremantle in the Second World War, which no one remembers. Um, so that building went through several different phases. So those women, moved out of there and then to here and then I'm not sure what happened after that but the building itself in Fremantle then fell into disrepair for a couple of decades and was eventually rescued as the art centre. Yes, wow, thank you very much. And I, I'll just add thank to you. that too because um, yeah it wasn't just the women who were transferred because at that point there was a crisis because the men were at war and a lot of women who usually do the job of caring for um, their elders, they were working. There was actually this uh, huge amount of women going into aged care because there was no one to look after them. And so there was huge overcrowding. 
And so they did seem to be a mix, because I remember reading one letter from Matron Powell actually talking about that she needed to separate the respectable women from the less respectable women. And so that was telling. So there was sort of a, a bit of a class difference yeah, yeah. as well. So we've made you work really hard. Uh, when we were going to have Nandy join you, I was thinking perhaps about 45 minutes for the two poets, uh, including the Q&A. Uh, you've been hard at it for 40 minutes without a breath. Have you one more that you'd like to read us? And we might then uh, invite some last questions from the, uh, from the audience and then we'll be able to relax and have a cup of tea with everyone. Sounds lovely. Thank you. All right. Um, so this poem I drew on, I guess, the furniture uh, in the house. And I was looking at maybe the impact of colonisation on the landscape um, and as well, I guess, on the things that we don't talk about. You know, we, we like, for example, with Indigenous history, we, um, First Nations people are talking about truth-telling, the things we don't feel comfortable talking about. So I'm, I'm not really talking about them, but I'm just sort of reflecting on the gaps and omissions. Um, and as well, at the time in my little room, I was watching this eucalypt flood of gum over the river because it was so stormy. There was a limb failure and it was barricaded that these kids came running and just completely disregarded the tape and ran all over it. And that <laughs> quite inspired me <laughs> as well. Um, for display purposes only. A pearl shell deflects a grandiloquent theft to shoe visitors and a jarrah is brought down to size by a two-man cross-cut with teeth. In retrospect, we preserve a shelled walnut to archive the price paid for a flesh wound. The dining room is genteel in situ, cordoned off to safeguard the past. A knife box is a mahogany urn. Its secrets are conversation starters. Postcode snogs gossip on tree-lined streets. Capital gains glint on each time. A diorama is shelved to outlast the gums of banked habitat. A eucalypt sheds sentiment, but the children eschew the barricade tape and straddle its girth. <laughs> So, have we uh, any reflections to share from, uh, from the audience that you'd like to... Are you going to say something? I was looking, you look like you're about to start. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, there's a question there. A comment that about what I've heard and what I know about what you did here before and asking just for an open-ended comment on, on it, each of the poems and the stuff I heard you do here before uh, focuses on one particular aspect of this area, this building, and same is true of the Fremont Last Centre. It's a building that's had quite distinct phases of, of its life. I'm always interested in the transitions between those. Have you any thoughts on what happens when one place becomes another place? Because it's all in the, in the same geographical location, but they're actually different places. Mm. Um, I don't think I wrote any poems about the transition. Um, I did write a poem looking at maybe the change in attitudes, but that's more, you know, values and attitudes of the time. So there was one I was looking at, um, there was a, something in the archive I was reading that when Charles Harper wanted to start the school and he was asked uh, what denomination, what religious denomination did you want it to be? And he said, well, this is what was recorded as him saying, um, anything but Catholic. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. Because <laughs> I was raised Catholic. I mean, I, I am a lapsed Catholic now, but it was just interesting. And so then I did some research and found up to the 50s that there was a big 
split between, you know, Catholic and Anglican, and, and that the, uh, or I don't know if I'm using the right words, but like the Anglicans or Protestants, whatever, um, wore black shoes to school, and the, the Catholic kids wore brown shoes, and there were lots of signs up about need not apply to certain jobs. And so I found that fascinating, and I did write a poem about that because I come from a, a working class Irish Italian background. And so it made me think, oh, that's interesting. And it made me feel kind of powerful being here. It was like a testament to my parents. I felt like I'd entered the establishment. <laughs> Even though, of course, it's not like that anymore. It was once, I guess. Yes, that's it. But just that comment was fascinating, and I thought, oh, that's interesting, yeah. And they talked, like, one of the, the terms was smells and bells, um, which was derogatory, talking about Catholic and Irish, which, yeah, was unfortunately a derogatory term. Very much so. Yeah. So, a question at the back. Thanks. Well, Charles' father, of course, was an uh, was a Anglican minister, so, uh, and there was very few Catholics in the colony at that time. Oh, yeah. So I think that comment you made was probably not quite what, what you Within might expect context. it to be. Yeah, possibly, yeah. <laughs> um, maybe with uh, the post-war migration there was uh, perhaps an increase. I know that's where my family came. Yeah. Thank you. Can I just make a comment? When just after the, um, in the very early days, in the 18, late 1800s, um, Mercy nuns came out um, with the, on the ships and they set up what is what was called our, the Ladies' College, then up, which became Our Ladies' College in Mercedes, which is the oldest private girls' school in Australia. In the dispatches to um, Captain Stirling, no, Governor Philip, I beg your pardon, when the first wave of people, including mainly as convicts, to settle. In his dispatches, it was very interesting to read that there was an instruction that no Catholic would be allowed to hold any position of office, etc. And of course, there was the old rebellion and my memory's failing me. What was it called? Jacobites. So they were dead scared that they were going to have a Jacobite stronghold here. Um, so that explains this inbuilt, yeah. rather regrettable um, wall between the Anglicans and the Catholics. Having been educated by both, I managed to slip down the crease and. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I imagine it was brought over that attitude about. Yeah. Indeed. So, do we have any other reflections, any other thoughts that anybody would love you, anyone busting to ask a question, but you don't want to? Lisa is going to join us for afternoon tea. So, uh, I'm going to draw uh, this part of the afternoon to a conclusion. Uh, thank everybody for joining us. I'll conclude by saying that amongst you today, uh, many members of the National Trust, and there are some who are not members. So these sorts of events are ones which we bring to our membership as one of the benefits to share in uh, intimate and quite special experiences sharing the history of WA and learning about the cause of connecting our community to the value of heritage. Should any of you wish to join, uh, then you may just jump online where it's made very easy for you to sign up. So uh, I welcome that. So great thanks to Lottery West, thanks to our volunteers, Thank you to Lisa. Uh, it's been an absolute joy and privilege having you share uh, your inspired work with us today, and we're most appreciative. Thank, Thank you. you.